It is 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and so it's time for us to begin our webinar here at CWNP, and we're so glad that you could join us. My name is Tom Carpenter, and I'm the CTO here at CWNP, and very excited about today's topic. We're going to spend the next 30 minutes or so talking about how wireless LANs work. Once someone gets connected to the wireless network, how do they actually go about gaining access to the medium, the RF and the channel, and actually transmitting a frame. Or for that matter, when they're receiving a frame, how did the other end of that link gain access to the medium to begin communicating? So that's our focus here today. Now this is a little more technical than some of our webinars are at times, but we'll also not get into the extreme depth of every little detail. But by the time this webinar is done, you should have a good understanding of the fundamental methods that are used by wireless devices in order to transmit information on wireless networks. And that's really the goal of this webinar. Now, as always, the webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to find it archived on our CWNP TV YouTube channel in the next couple of days after the webinar is over. So if you want to review it at a later time or share it with someone else, it will be available there. And of course, we'll make sure we tweet about it on Twitter to let you know that it is available on YouTube. Although I said we'll tweet about it on Twitter, I'm not sure where else we'd tweet about it at. So I suppose it was obvious that if we're going to tweet about it, we'll be tweeting about it on Twitter. Okay, with that said, we're going to be talking then about how we go about accessing the network. The image you see before you right now, we'll talk about a bit more later on, but this is a direct image from the 802.11 standard, which kind of defines the breakdown about how all of this works. So the first thing we're going to do today is talk about the channel access requirements based on the fact that it is a wireless medium. What are the requirements? We'll get into the differences between the way wired and wireless networks work in that way. And then we're going to talk about two specific functions that are used to gain access to the wireless medium and begin communications. One is called the distributed coordination function or DCF. It's been with us the longest. And the other one is called the enhanced distributed channel access method which also has an enhanced distributed access uh, channel access function. So we'll be talking about that as well and all the parts and pieces that make up these things. And then we'll briefly talk about RTS, CTS as well at the end, which is another method that is used during communications to accommodate down level clients as well as dealing with interference issues and other such scenarios. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started talking about all of these important things. First of all, then, I want to talk about 802.11 channel access requirements. So 802.11 networks use radio frequency, and radio frequency is an open, shared medium. And because we operate in a license-free space with 802.11, such as 2.4 gigahertz, portions of the 5 gigahertz band, uh, even now sub-1 gigahertz, and even all the way down to 50-something megahertz for some TV white space scenarios, and all the way up to 60 gigahertz with 802.11 AD or DMG physical air devices. So the point is, there, there's more frequency space that we use today than ever with 802.11 devices, but the one thing they all share in common is that they are open shared medium. And so the point is that multiple devices in the same channel must share access. And the device cannot detect what's happening somewhere else. So for example, there is no way if you're using a loudspeaker system at a particular location and you've got a microphone and you're blasting the volume from where you are, there's no way for you to know that someone one block away is going to be able to interpret those sound waves because they may have someone else blasting a loudspeaker right there by them and you can't actually hear it where you are. So with sound waves at a distance, I can't know for sure that that person at the distance can process what I'm putting out from my speakers. And they can't know that I can process what they're putting out from their speakers. We can understand that because we all have experience with sound waves. We can process them with our ears, right? In the same way with wireless, there's no way for a transmitting station to know as it's sending information that the receiving station doesn't have interference or some factor impacting it there. 
And that's why we use special types of communications in 802.11 networks, like acknowledgement frames, to acknowledge the receipt of information. So devices can't detect what's happening in other locations. They only know what's happening at their location. We need to use that strategically as we access the channel. And therefore, an algorithm is needed to assist in the prevention of collisions. So there's no way to know what's going on at a remote location. So we need to have some method that we can try to use to prevent from causing a collision at that remote location. Devices should be able to detect signals at the lowest modulation rate used within the channel. This is a requirement of 802.11 channel access. They need to be able to see that signal at the lowest possible data rate. Now, it's important to keep in mind then that the lowest data rate is the one that you can demodulate at the greatest distance, right? And so since that's the case, it means that if something is sent at that low data rate, even at a distance, I should be able to decode that or demodulate that. This is uh, the primary key to proper wireless LAN shared access, actually, the need to be able to detect signals at the lowest modulation rate. So if you've studied 802.11 in any depth, you may know something that's a little bit outside of the scope of our topic today, but important to comprehend related to this bullet. And that is that the physical layer header. So when you send an 802.11 frame on the network, there's a MAC header that comes from the data link layer, the MAC sub layer of the data link layer. There's a MAC header that gets passed down to the physical layer. And at the physical layer, there's something there called the Physical Layer Convergence Protocol, PLCP, actually puts a header on it as well. Well, that header, that physical layer header, is actually transmitted at the lowest modulated data rate used within the channel, regardless of what data rate the frame itself is sent at, the uh, MAC layer frame. So that MAC layer frame, if you've studied some of the things on the way to CWNA, you've probably heard of terms like MSDU, MPDU, PSDU, PPDU. Well, that MAC layer frame in the MAC, once it's ready, is called the MPDU, the MAC protocol data unit. But once it's sent down to the physical layer, it's now called the PSDU. So what is the MAC frame is called the PSDU at the physical layer. That PSDU is what is sent at whatever data rate you might think you're transmitting at. But the physical layer header is not sent at that data rate. It's sent at the lowest modulation rate or data rate that's used within that channel. And that's done so that any device at any remote location that could possibly at all process any frame that could be sent should be able to process that physical layer header. Okay, so that's a key factor here in, in channel access as well. And we'll see that come into play when we talk a little bit about carrier sense. So in a wired network, we have something called carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. The concept here is we can use CSMA CD because we can detect collisions that happen on the wire. With wireless, we can't detect a collision that happens at that remote location. I've talked about that. So we need to use something different. And what we use is carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance. We want to try to avoid the collision in the first place. Now, let me be very clear. You're not going to be able to avoid every possible collision. And so there will be times that collisions occur. And when those collisions occur, we're going to know it inherently by the fact that the transmitter does not get an acknowledgement back, either a standard acknowledgement frame or what's called a block acknowledgement frame. So it's not going to get that acknowledgement back. And since it didn't get the acknowledgement, what does it know? Or at least assume. It assumes the frame didn't get through. So what will it do? It will retry that frame. So it will send it again because it didn't get the acknowledgement. So yes, it tries to avoid collision, but there is even a mechanism there that in the case where we assume a collision or some kind of corruption that kept the frame from being received, we do retransmit it. CSMA CA, I like to talk about it in a very colloquial level, something non-technical. So here we have basically the flow that we might think of for collision avoidance in 802.11 networks. So over time, we go through this process. We say, is anyone talking? No, maybe I should wait a while. If it's still quiet, I think I'll talk and then I talk. Did they say they heard me? If not, I'll say it again. Now that might seem simple, but if you've studied the distributed coordination function before, you probably realize that's pretty much it. That's pretty much what it does. So it says, is anyone talking? No, they're not. 
well, maybe I should wait a while. Now think about human communications. If we're courteous to the other person that's talking, the very instant they quit talking, we don't immediately talk, do we? We, we have a little bit of a pause there. And that's kind of being courteous to the other person to make sure they're really done talking. And then if it's still quiet, we'll go ahead and talk. Now that maybe I should wait a while. And if it's still quiet, I think I'll talk. There are a few different processes that go on there. But one key thing to keep in mind is that in 802.11, while we're saying, maybe I should wait a while. If it's quiet, I think I'll talk. While we're thinking about that in 802.11, we're still asking the very first question. Is anyone talking now? Is anyone talking now? Is anyone talking now? Okay, I know I sound like a five-year-old, but that's what your wireless device does. So as it's going through the collision avoidance algorithm, either DCF or EDCAF, as it's going through it, it's continually saying, is anyone talking? Is anyone talking? Is anyone talking? So it keeps doing that all through the process. And we'll talk more about that as we go through and look at what happens here. So let's go ahead and look at a little bit more of a technical representation of CSMACA. So here we're seeing the method that's been in 802.11 since 802.11.1997, 802.11 prime. It's called the distributed coordination function or DCF. It's still the foundation of channel access, even in the newer devices. So from a single station perspective, because I wanted to remove a little bit of complexity when we talk about this, the single station after a frame has already been transmitted and that frame is finished, it's time now for the station to decide if it's going to get to talk or not. The first thing it has to do is wait the duration of something called an interframe space. So an interframe space is an intentional delay imposed on communications in order to give the opportunity for more important frames to be transmitted. For example, if I'm getting ready to transmit a data frame, that might not be the most important frame. Let's say, for example, that a station has transmitted a data frame. Well, that means I saw that frame, that frame's done. I, before I can transmit, have to wait a special interframe space but that's because I want to transmit another data frame. The station that received that data frame needs to send a different frame, doesn't it? It's called an acknowledgement frame or a block acknowledgement frame. It's more important that that acknowledgement frame gain access to the medium than my data frame. And the reason is if that acknowledgement frame does not gain access to the medium, what did we already learn? The original sending station is going to retry, isn't it? And so to prevent a second transmission of that frame that's unnecessary, we have a short interframe space. That's literally what it's called. It's called the short interframe space. So we have a short interframe space or a SIFS that is used before an acknowledgement frame, but I don't get to use that for my data frame. I have to use either a DCF interframe space, a DIFFS, or an arbitration interframe space, AIFS. So I have to use one of those two for my data frame, depending on if it's traditional data or QoS data. But the point is I have to wait one of them. And guess what both of them are? They're both longer than a SIFS, okay? So both of them are longer than a short interframe space and therefore the ACK should get access to the medium first. Now, once we've all waited the interframe space, we still don't communicate immediately. We have to use a random back off timer. And this random back off timer takes advantage of something called a contention window, which think of this as a window as a range, a contention range, rather than uh, thinking of it as a window of time per se. Instead, it's a range of values. OK, so I'm going to draw a random number from that range of values, and that's going to become my back off timer. What we have is for every physical layer, we have something called a slot time. And if I draw a random number of seven, it means I'm going to wait seven slot times. And then once I've counted down my back off timer, then I get to the point where I can now transmit the frame. But wait, some interesting things have been happening here while I've been waiting an interframe space in a backup timer. That whole time, I have been asking the question, is anyone talking? Is anyone talking? Is anyone talking, right? So that's what that blue carrier sense line is that's underneath of the interframe space and the back off timer. Now, what does that mean? It means that let's say I get past the interframe space and I get to the back off timer and I drew a back off timer of seven and two slots go by. I'm down to five. And guess what? Someone starts talking. What that means is I have to stop my back off timer. 
okay? And I have to acknowledge that this other communication is happening, whatever it is. Wait until it's done, and then I get to resume my back off timer again. And then if I only count down three slots and I hear someone talking again, guess what? I stop my back off timer and I wait. And then I still got two left after whatever happens, happens. And then I count down those two and oh, finally I get to zero and I get to transmit my frame. Now realize we're talking microseconds here. We're not talking human time. We're talking computer time. So yes, I might have to wait, defer to others a couple of times, but I'm going to get to transmit my frame most likely well under a second because we're talking about microseconds for all of this to happen. Now, as we've talked about this carrier sense, it's important to know that there are two kinds of carrier sense. They are physical and virtual. And within physical carrier sense, there are actually two kinds. There's frame detect, which we sometimes just call carrier sense or CS, and there's energy detect or ED. And then for virtual, there's something called the NAV timer, the network allocation vector timer. And we're going to get into that a little bit later on. So the core components of DCF are carrier sense, inner frame spaces, back off timers, and then finally frame transmission. And guess what we do as soon as we get done transmitting our frame? We go right back to carrier sense. So that's the basic components here of DCF. Now let's look at that opening diagram that we saw when we first started this discussion. And I said we'd talk about it a little bit more later on. Here what we're looking at is that 802.11 diagram. And the different components we've talked about are all here. So first there's the inner frame spaces. And you'll notice that we have the arbitration interframe space, AIFS, the DCF interframe space, DIFS. There's the PCF interframe space, but we don't use it because no one implements PCF. So we don't really use that for any consistent basis. Uh, SIFS is the short interframe space. And the big thing is to notice it's the shortest. And then we've got our diffs and then we've got our AIFS. Now, the reality is that AIFS is usually shorter than DIFS for a QoS frame that has a high priority. So the diagram doesn't automatically represent it as accurately as you might like, but that is the basic concept we have of the communication. We see the back off timer here. We see carrier sense. So all of this is really illustrated in this diagram that when we first had it up at the beginning might have been a bit confusing. But now that we've talked about some of these pieces, you might be able to understand a little bit more about exactly what's going on here. Now let's go a little deeper into this thing that we do the whole time we're waiting to get our turn on the medium. And that is we're asking that question. Remember, is anyone talking? This is carrier sense. And I said physical carrier sense has really two types. And they're both under the heading of clear channel assessment. Basically, we have frame detect or carrier sense, which is CS. And that's where we're detecting the signal strength of 802.11 frames. So if we see an 802.11 frame above a particular threshold of energy strength in the channel, we have to acknowledge that that frame is being transmitted and not communicate while it is. Now, what is that actual level? Well, there's a d definition in the standard for all of the different physical layers and what that level is. And then there's what vendors do. So uh, there's no automatic way to say, here's the level, because the standard specifies some things. And then vendors can play a little loose with that in order for their devices to possibly get priority or be able to communicate and so forth. So carrier sense or frame detect is about detecting a frame. And when we detect a frame, we have to acknowledge that frame is being transmitted. And by the way, we can see that a frame is being transmitted even if we don't see it with a good enough signal to be able to demodulate it. What do I mean by that? Remember I said earlier that the physical header is sent at the lowest data rate of modulation in that particular band or channel, right? Well, the physical header has a length value in it that tells you how long that frame is, including the PSDU, therefore including the payload. So it tells you that, and because it tells me that, and it also tells me the data rate, even though I may not be able to demodulate the actual frame because the signal is too weak, I was able to demodulate the physical header, and from there, I can determine how long that frame is going to be. And so there's, there's information there that helps me to understand that as a client 
that is not the target of that frame. And by the way, you might wonder, well, why would I be able to see it if I'm not the target then? Again, the, the I might be 100 feet from the access point and the target is 15 feet from the access point. So it can use a much higher data rate for the actual PSDU, the payload, than what I would be able to receive from that access point. I might be at the lowest data rate for all my data when I talk to the AP, but that one that's only 15 feet away can use one of the higher data rates. I cannot demodulate that data rate from where I am because I don't have a good enough signal to noise ratio. And time fails us to get into all the details of that today, but just know for now that even though I can't demodulate the PSDU, the upper payload, I can demodulate the PPDU header. Okay. So then I have the other method of physical carrier sense, which is called energy detect. Now, when we're dealing with energy detect, what we're dealing with here is the ability to just measure power in the channel. This is usually roughly 20 dB stronger as a requirement than frame detect. So if frame detect says, well, if a frame is at neg, let's say 82 dBm, then I have to acknowledge it. Um, energy detect then would be if the signal energy, whether it's an 802.11 frame or not, is at neg 62 or better, then I have to acknowledge it. So there's usually around 20 dB of separation between frame detect and energy detect. And again, this would mean then if it's, let's say, uh, a video camera that works in 2.4 gigahertz and my station's in 2.4 gigahertz and it's not an 802.11 frame, but I can see that signal at say neg 53, then I'm going to have to acknowledge that that's there and wait for that signal to go silent before I can communicate. Okay, so that would be a non Wi Fi interferer that's making me be quiet and keeping me from being able to transmit. The other method of carrier sense is virtual carrier sense, and this is using the network allocation vector within my system. And the way it works is when I see an 802.11 frame that I can decode, and I have to be able to decode the PSDU. This is in the MAC header. So when I can decode it, I can see something in there called a duration value. And that duration value is what I set my nav timer to. And I know I have to wait until that duration expires before I would be able to gain access to the medium. Now, it's important to understand that this duration value that sets my nav timer is not the duration of the current frame. It's the duration of the sequence of frames or inner frame spaces after the current frame that must be completed to finish the transaction. So, for example, if this is just a typical send a frame, get an acknowledgement, send a frame, get an acknowledgement, then I know that it has to be after this frame is done, a short inner frame space and then an acknowledgement frame, right? So I know that has to happen. There's no sense in me even trying to talk until that's over with because that actually has to take place. So I can set my nav timer to that. So here we're looking at a packet capture in Wireshark, okay? And this was actually captured with a different tool and then saved as a PCAP NG file for Wireshark. And sometimes when you do that, you'll lose your radio tap header information because the tool might not know how to write that into a PCAP NG file. And that's the case here. So I don't get to see my data rates and things like that, but I do see my actual Mac frame header. And we're going to talk a little bit about RTS CTS later on, but right now I'm going to look at an RTS CTS data block acknowledgement. So we're going to go through that sequence so you can actually see this duration value. So the first frame we're looking at in the sequence here goes from a Netgear device to an Apple device. Now, interestingly, this is an RTS CTS originating in the wireless router. In this case, it's a home wireless router. So the Netgear 802.11 AC router is saying to the Apple client, I want to send some stuff to you. The client responds back to the Netgear and says, you're clear, you're good to go. Then the Netgear sends to the Apple client a significant amount of data, and then we have the block acknowledgement. Now, what I want us to do is pay close attention to the duration values. They're highlighted down here below, okay? So the RTS says the duration that I'm requesting is 2,910 microseconds. Then clear to send says now it's only 2,866. Why the difference? Well, we're subtracting the amount of time it took the RTS and the SIFs before the CTS to transpire, right? So because of that, we are counting down, you might say. Now we have the 
the clear to send saying from this point forward, we need 2866 microseconds, right? Look at how short it gets in the actual data frame. The actual data frame says the duration is only 48 microseconds. Well, that's obviously not the duration of this data frame. This thing's 1550 bytes in size. Okay, so that's not the duration of this data frame. This data frame, if we take a look back, we were at 2866. It's now saying there's going to be 48 left. So effectively, about 2800 microseconds are required just to send this data frame. Okay, uh, and then this data frame says even after this data frame's done, we're still going to need another 48 microseconds to get this done. And then we get our block acknowledgement. And look at the duration value of the block acknowledgement. And this kind of helps give away the way this works. Of course, it's defined in the standard too, and you could read it there. But what we see is that the block acknowledgement frame has a duration of zero microseconds. Wait a minute, do you mean this is some miracle frame that's 28 bytes in size and we can send it instantaneously with no elapsed time? Absolutely not. And this reveals what the duration value is. This duration value being set to zero microseconds tells me that this is the last frame in this transaction sequence. There you go. There's the giveaway. Okay. So the duration value is equal to the time after the current frame that is required to complete the current transaction. There is no time after the current frame that's required to complete the transaction. And therefore my duration is zero microseconds. So I hope you follow that. And that's the concept of the virtual carrier sense or the nav timer. And that's the way that's actually going to work. Now, we've also talked about the inner frame space delays. These are the gaps before a frame can be sent, right? So we've got, there's one here on the screen, the reduced inner frame space uh, that has a very short time. That was introduced in 802.11n, but 802.11ac doesn't use it. So some 802.11n devices could use it, but it's not used by 11ac. It will probably eventually be removed from the standard. We do have the short inner frame space. We have the DCF interframe space, and we have the arbitration interframe space, which we can't really say is shorter than DCF interframe space or longer because it depends on the settings for AIFS. Okay, so those can be adjusted for the different access categories, and we'll talk about that a little more as we go along. Now, we also talked about the fact that we set a random back off timer based on a contention window, which is a range of numbers from which stations randomly select a back off value. So for 802.11b, that window was from 0 to 15. So they're going to get something 1, 7, 12. They might get unlucky and draw 15, right? But they're going to pull a number from it. 802.11ag um, also has a contention window. And you'll notice one of the key things here is it determines how long in slots the wireless medium needs to be idle before a station can transmit. So we have to wait that window of time. This is one of the things that is manipulated for AIFS that adjusts and gives priority. So for example, a voice over IP frame may draw random values from 0 to 3. A video may be 0 to 7. Everything else, 0 to 15, 0 to 31, whatever you set it to. So the point is that through this, we can give a much shorter uh, random back off window or range that they're pulling from for those particular devices. So in overview with DCFS, uh, with DCF, or I should say, we have inner frame spaces, the duration ID, which sets the nav timer, carrier sense, listen before you talk all the way, and random back off. Now, I have a little graphic here to the side to remind you the duration is the time after the data frame including the SIFs and the acknowledgement frame required to complete the transaction. Okay, so we've gone over DCF, and now we can a little more quickly go over EDCA. But I do want to clear something up. You'll see some white papers and, and documents and things like that that talk about something called EDCF. EDCF in the 802.11 standard does not exist. There's, there's no such thing, and, and you can understand the confusion, okay? So we've got this thing called HCF, the hybrid coordination function, and we've got HCF contention access, that's EDCA, and we've got HCF controlled access, that's HCCA, and then you've got something called 
EDCAF in the standard. So you bring all this together and it gets a bit confusing. There's nothing called EDCF. There is something called EDCA and there is something called EDCAF. Here's the difference. EDCA describes how this channel access mechanism works. EDCAF is a specific function for one of the queues that is being used. So the queues are based on access categories. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And each access category queue has its own EDCAF or process routine function, whatever you want to call it, that implements an instance of EDCA for that specific queue. Okay, so that's EDCAF as opposed to just EDCA. And again, you'll see people that talk about EDCA the whole time saying it is EDCAF. And then you'll see people that never mention EDCAF. And I must say, when I first began trying to study this years ago, it was a bit confusing to me too. So that's the difference between EDCA and EDCAF. EDCA generally defines how this contention-based algorithm works. EDCAF is a specific implementation of that algorithm for an access category queue. All right, so that brings us to then all the parts and pieces of EDCAF. Um, there are many different components. We have access categories, which is how we mark the frames to define the priority queue that they should go into. And they can be voice, video, etc. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Then we have the queues they go into. And then there's the contention window, which is changed. So instead of just having one contention window for every frame in the PHY, we have different contention windows depending on the access category. Then we also have the opportunity for each access category to specify an AIFS number, an arbitration interframe space number. This AIFSN is the number of slots that we should count down for the category, okay? So if it's two, then we've got two slot times for that access category. If it's seven, we've got seven slot times for that category, okay? So that's AIFSN, which gives us what our actual arbitration interframe space is. And then when we get a transmit opportunity, we get to transmit. Now, I have to go over this being a webinar context at a fairly rapid pace. So keep in mind, this is recorded. You can go back and review this on CWMP TV at a later time. If it's a bit confusing to you, maybe draw yourself some diagrams and think it through in that way. And that'll probably help you keep it all in orderly sequence as well. Now the access categories we have, there are four of them. And what we do is we take user priorities um, that we would typically use, say in a wired network or some kind of bridging environment, and we map those over to access categories. So the access categories are background, best effort, video, and voice. AC underscore BA, BK stands for access category background. AC underscore BA stands for access category best effort. So when you see this kind of terminology, that's what you're referring to. The highest priority AC is voice. The second highest is video. The third highest is best effort. The fourth highest is background. Now, how do we know that they're the higher priority? What makes them a higher priority? Two major things. The contention window for an ACVO frame usually has a shorter range with a lower maximum value. So for example, zero to three. The contention window for video, a little longer, maybe zero to seven, okay? Uh, and then the second thing is the AIFSN the number of slot times that we have to wait is going to be lower for voice than it is for video, than it is for best effort, than it is for background. Okay, so all these things come together to give that higher priority. Now, once a frame has been mapped to an access category, it's going to be put into a queue. This graphic comes right out of the 802.11 standard with the exception of some of the color highlighting and the transmit opportunity label at the bottom. So in the standard, it tells you, hey, we're going to receive these MSDUs that have user priorities and we need to map those to an access category. Once they're mapped to an access category, they go into the proper queue for that access category. So you can see here, we've got a voice queue, a video queue, a best effort queue, and a background queue. Then you've got an EDCAF. Remember we talked about that? Each queue has an EDCAF 
as it works today. Now, I emphasize that because a lot of people don't know, but when 802.11aa, yeah, a lot of people don't even know 802.11aa existed, but when 802.11aa was ratified, one of the things it did is it actually gave us two more cues. So you can actually have two cues for voice, two cues for video, and then just one for best effort and one for background, according to the standard as it is today. And then the way it works is you can have a voice cue that is the highest priority voice cue and a second voice cue that's called the alternate voice cue that can have a little lower priority. And then you can have a video cue that's the highest priority and a second video cue that's a little lower priority. So it allows us to have what are called intra-access category prioritization. So meaning in the voice access category, we can have prioritization between two cues and not just one. But again, we don't have that in most production devices today. It is very new. It was actually ratified in 2012, but we still don't see it implemented in most devices today. Most of them still use these same four cues that we actually see right here. Okay. Now then we have something called WMM, Wi-Fi Multimedia or Wireless Multimedia. This is actually a certification by the Wi-Fi Alliance based on EDCA, which by the way was released 12 years ago, 802.11e2005, okay? And WMM specifies only the use of the four access categories and the devices that implement EDCA usually do so according to WMMA certification so that they can be compatible. And what we see on the right side here is the WMM tags that are in beacon frames from an access point. So an access point sends out these uh, tags uh, in the field or frame fields that indicate AIFSN numbers. So for example, if you look down here toward the bottom, you see AC voice, right? So this is the voice access category. Notice for the voice access category, the AIFSN is one. So it's equal to one slot time. For the video, it's also one. For background, it's seven. And for best effort, it's three. And then we see the contention window here. So the min is two, the max is three. The min is three, the max is four. The min is four, the max is 10. The min is four, the max is six. Now again, these are simply the values of one capture that I did from one device, okay? So devices can vary because these can be customized by the device vendor to give some kind of prioritization that they might desire for their particular system or environment. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, we've covered the basics of how devices go about gaining access to the medium. Now what we're going to do is get into a little bit of a special case scenario that we see implemented almost just ubiquitously today. Uh, very rarely do you see just data frames going around anymore, it seems. They are preceded by an RTS-CTS exchange or at least just some mystical CTS frame that's out there by itself. So the concept of RTS-CTS is to take advantage of this duration value in frame headers and send the RTS and CTS frames at what we call the lowest basic rate of the channel. Now the lowest basic rate of the channel is basically the rate at which beacon frames are sent at. It is the lowest required rate. So in other words, no device could be participating in the BSS uh, if it didn't support that lowest data rate, okay? So it'll send it out, if you think about it logically, at that data rate, and therefore every device ought to be able to see either the RTS or the CTS. So if a client sends an RTS to the AP and the AP sends back a CTS, like we see in the diagram to the right, then all the stations can see that CTS. Even if normally the client on the left would transmit and for one reason or another, the other stations would not be able to see that client's transmission because in this case, we have this thick wall blocking it or what have you. They will be able to see the CTS that's sent out from the AP. I mean, if they can't see it, then they can't really participate in what that AP is doing, right? And that has a duration value in it. So the point of RTS-CTS is basically to say, would y'all be quiet? Somebody needs to talk. Think about it like when you were a kid and the adults were talking and you went up and said, hey, mom, hey, mom, hey, mom. And then eventually mom said, would you be quiet? We're trying to talk. All right. This is a couple of devices on the network saying to all the other devices on the network, would you be quiet? We're trying 
to talk. And so you send the RTS, and we saw this in the capture, you send the RTS, then the CTS, then the actual data, then the acknowledgement, and that nav timer starts at some maximum level in RTS, the duration value, I should say, and that gets reduced as we go down the chain. We saw that. The RTS has the longest duration, then the CTS a little shorter, then the data a lot shorter, because the only thing that's left after that is a short interframe space and the acknowledgement. And here we see that actual exchange that we would go through then. So on the left is no RTS-CTS. There's a DCF interframe space. We send the data. There's a short interframe space. We send the acknowledgement. It'd be a dream if we could always use that. But there are so many down-level clients and other situations where RTS-CTS is useful that in many cases, if not most, it becomes way more efficient to have RTS-CTS enabled. So with it, there's a diffs because we're waiting for that first transmit opportunity, right? So before the RTS is a DCF interframe space. Uh, then after the RTS, though, there's a SIFS, then the CTS, then after the CTS, there's a SIFS, then the data, then after the data, there's a SIFS, then the acknowledgement. So that short interframe space is used between the RTS and the CTS to try to give priority to that CTS frame to clear up the channel so that data can be communicated. After all, let's step back. Whatever the station is that weighted that diffs, and then sent the RTS is being courteous to all the neighbors. It's actually raising its hand saying, I'd like to talk. So it might be nice to give some priority to that request, use a short interframe space and then a clear to send, and then a short interframe space in the data, and then a short interframe space in the acknowledgement. So that client was being really nice by making sure that this communication can happen as much as possible without disrupting all other communications on the network.